Hello and welcome to today's SDI podcast. I'm Scarlett Bays, Senior Research Analyst at SDI, your host for today, and I'm joined by two very special guests. The first being SDI's very own Service Operations Manager, Jamie Bell, as well as Dr. John Barry, who I will give a full and necessary introduction to in a little bit. Some of the topics which we're going to be talking about today are around mental health, which may be triggering for some listeners. So if you're listening to this and you do find some subjects around mental health sensitive, I would suggest not listening to this podcast. Having said that, it is hopefully uh, International Men's Day on the day that this is being uploaded. And something which ITSM and International Men's Day have in common is a focus around mental health and particularly men's mental health, which is what we're going to be talking about today. So we do have an expert on this podcast, which is really exciting for us, and that is Dr. John A. Barry, who's a Chartered Psychologist and Associate Fellow of the British Psychological Society, Honorary Lecturer in Psychology at University College London, Clinical Hypnotherapist, and author of around 70 peer-reviewed publications and book chapters on a variety of topics in psychology and medicine. John is a professional researcher and has taken an interest in improving the teaching of research methods and statistics. He has practiced clinical hypnosis for several years and is a member of the British Association of Clinical and Academic Hypnosis. His PhD was awarded by City University London on the topic of the psychological aspects of polycystic ovary syndrome, which is also the topic of his forthcoming book. He is co-founder of both Male Psychology Network and the Male Psychology Section of the British Psychological Society lead organiser of the Male Psychology Conference and co-editor of the Palgrave Handbook of Male Psychology and Mental Health. So thank you both for joining me today. Um, I know you've got very busy schedules, uh, but just quick question for you, John, first of all, to start. Uh, what got you into psychology in the first place? Um, well, I wasn't really looking to get into psychology. I just kind of by chance uh, did a, a short course in psychology or where psychology was part of it, and I found it really fascinating. It was um, the, the stuff like uh, Zimbardo's uh, prison study, Milgram's obedience study, um, these sorts of things that, that grab a lot of people's attention, really grab my attention. And, uh, and once I started wanting to learn more about psychology, uh, you know, I didn't stop, I haven't stopped since. So I'm kind of, I'm somebody who's like, endlessly sort of interested in, in various aspects of psychology, not, not various. Um, but so yeah, there, there's certain things psychology I find, find very fascinating and I, I, I uh, want to continue doing that. My first answer was much better, by the way. <laughs> yes, we had some technical difficulties, unfortunately, <laughs> but the second time around will be just as good. Um, so, one of your focuses is men's mental health, and I would say that in recent years that's become much more of a focus in general for the public. Um, and do you know why this has come about? Yeah, I think that the reason it has um, come about because of people's personal experiences. So the, the general public, um, there's lots of people who will have had an experience of either losing somebody to suicide or knowing somebody who's uh, contemplated suicide and being very disturbed and upset. And uh, most often this is going to be men because men commit suicide about three times the rate that women do. And uh, so a lot of people will have had this problem of of um, seeing men really suffering, and part of the characteristic of, of male suicide is that, that um, um, sometimes th there's no obvious lead up to it. So, like, th there's there's no uh, cry for help. There's no kind of indicator that, that there's something wrong. And in fact, because of of the way men tend to deal with stress, um, which tends to be a bit different uh, than women, uh, not completely different, but the, there are some general differences that, that people tend to overlook because they don't think about them as being signs of depression. So things like um, uh, irritability, uh, uh, drinking more, substance abuse, uh, also pornography use, um, playing video games uh, a lot. So like that when, when men are doing these things uh, and, and they're not saying I'm doing this because I'm stressed or I'm doing this because I, I kind of like, I, I've, you know, I, I'm desperate about X, Y, Z issue. When when you don't get those sorts of indicators, people just say, "Well, you know, what's he, he's out getting drunk all the time? Like, what's wrong with him? He's, he's getting into fights with people. You know, what an idiot! You know, they, they we don't we don't really understand that that there are gender differences in the expression of mental health problems. And I I, I think it's 
it's really important that we do as psychologists, and I think um, in the general public there is a bit more awareness actually, funnily enough, um, about these sorts of gender differences than there is in, in academia and within psychology. And it's a funny sort of thing. I mean, um, I'm in a position where I'm doing research into men's mental health and I'm finding things like the, these sorts of interesting gender differences that are far more surprising for academics than they are for the general public. You know, the, and the, it, it's, it, we, I think we've got used to, in academia, um, the, the, the ideas that are very valid, like um, this, um, this notion that men and women are largely the same, so that there's very few differences. Um, so we can just treat men and women as if they're exactly the same. And so you end up with a kind of a one-size-fits-all approach to men and women when it comes to mental health. And that means that we're blind then to a lot of, of the uh, differences. And there's not a huge number of differences, but, but we're, we're, we tend to be blind to these things. So we don't get any sense of, of um, understanding uh, what men's uh, mental health issues or problems look like, um, you know, what leads up to them. We, we, we have not got the, the capacity to, to, to start understanding these things unless we're investigating them. And we, we're not investigating because most of the time we don't even see them when they're, even when they're right under our noses. Speaking of men suffering, Jamie, <laughs> I've invited you here today because you are very passionate about mental health yourself. Um, would you like to talk on that? Too? Yeah, sure. So, um, I uh, probably yeah, about two two years ago now, um, sort of went through went through a bit of um, well, I guess we could just call it workplace stress um, that was going on for going on for quite a while, and uh, it was you know this it, it started it started off by me needing to kind of. It was affecting my personal life, you know, of, and, and I think I think what it came down to for me was not really being able to understand why certain I was behaving in certain ways, why um, I was reacting to situations in in ways in negative ways and such, and why I wasn't able to kind of focus and, and on things that were important, you know, not just important at work, but my, you know, important in my family life and such, and. Um, I took I took the leap took the leap of faith and, and went to went to see a doctor which was probably actually making that appointment was was you know probably the, the most difficult part of, of what, I, what I did actually um, you know to go and see the doctor in the first place and you know the, the, the doctor's the doctor's reaction was um, you know he, he, we we can we can set you up an appointment with Mind the charity Mind or or we can we can try we can try medication and um, I've I, you know I, I, I chose and uh, I chose the, the the mind route and set up a, um, um, some sessions of mind which were which were brilliant and we focused during our sessions on kind of you know uh, CBT um, behavioural therapy and understanding my thought patterns and that sort of thing and, and it got me and I realised through those sessions that. Well, all, everything, everything, all of my angst, everything I was talking about came back to work, you know, worrying about this, worrying about that, why, and such. And um, it caught me by surprise because I was just, you know, I was proud of where I'd, where I'd got to in my career. Okay, you know, I, 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 I was, you know, I, was, I, I, liked, I liked where I was. I was comfortable and, um, you know, in, in, in a financial sense, you know, recently married and such, had a, ch a child. And you know, I thought, well, what could what could it possibly be? And so I was I wasn't really willing to accept that it was work related stress. Um, but all roads all, all roads led to, to it being that. So I had to figure out a way to, to kind of remove myself from from that situation. And it's it, you know the, the the essence of the story is that by 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 being able to understand what the root cause of the problem was, I was able to fix that, address it. And, and start to start to make changes to you know get on get on a good path again, and I, t I talk about that, but I was in I was, I was in quite a fortunate position where I was able to um, make a drastic decision about about my job, and and, and, and move on from that. And um, you know there'll there'll be there'll be people in similar situations who won't be in a similar situation that I was in where I, where, where, they, where they could make that decision with. You know, with with the stability that I could, so you know, I, I'm I'm quite passionate about understanding, uh, you know, I, 
identifying behaviours in people now in, 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 in what, what's bringing about that you know adverse well-being for for, for, for my colleagues, for, for, for people I know, and for other, for other people. And I understand, you know, my article was able to help some people as well. That's, that's so, did did any of your colleagues notice any signs that you weren't quite right? No, no, I don't, I don't, I don't think so. Even you know, even even from a you know, I don't know, I don't want to talk ill or anything, but you know, there was I, I, I. I before making the decision I made to, to leave that organisation, I had I had reached out to uh, you know try and try and affect change. It wasn't forthcoming, um, and so you know that that, that, that was a, that was a factor. But um, I understand now, like since 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 those events, that you know more effort has been made to kind of r realise uh, adverse well-being in the workplace and such. Um, uh, certainly, were their concerns. So. And John, what would you say are some of the more recognisable signs of, say, workplace yeah. stress? Um, well, I, I, as I mentioned, drinking being one of them. So, like people, uh, kind of, it's going to affect your ability to work if you're, if you're drinking too much. So, sort of the performance of work falling off a bit, and um, maybe coming in late, kind of uh, uh, taking days off, things like that. Uh, also, sleep can be affected, so that will affect performance too. Um, also, just uh, in general, communication with people uh, might not be as good. Men uh, tend to, to, well, men tend to, like one of the ways of, of uh, reacting to stress is uh, withdrawing. So, like sometimes men can become quite withdrawn and, and not want to talk to, to people about, certainly not about their feelings, but uh, also not about uh, other things at work. So, sort of not really communicating well with other people or having communications that are a, a bit sort of irritable, so sort of you know, these sorts of things happening. And it's unfortunate because a lot of these things are, are um, they're, so, so like the, the kind of female typical sort of, of thing, or at least the, the stereotype of it is not necessarily true, but um, uh, is you think uh, that the, someone who's depressed, they're going to, to sort of look sad and cry and, uh, and want to talk about their feelings. and, and that, that kind of wanting to talk about your feelings is a more female, typical way of dealing with, uh, with distress. Uh, men uh, tend, men get a lot of, from talking about the feelings, but they tend not to want to do it by and large. Men will tend to, for, for various reasons, which are good reasons, tend not to, to want to, if they've got a problem, they want to fix the problem. They don't want to talk about their feelings, you know, so, and they also might prefer quite often a step-by-step -step approach to, to fixing the problem. So it's something that, that they can understand, like not a kind of a, like so some, some you know, kind of types of approaches to therapy are, are preferred over others because they're more step by step. For example, CBT, like it's quite a, a kind of a rational uh, sort of approach to, to dealing with thoughts and, uh, and feelings. Um, so a lot of men uh, do like that. And it's, and it's also very effective therapy to for relatively speaking effective therapy. But the unfortunate thing is that a lot of these um, like kind of what some people call male depression isn't often recognised as being depression, uh, especially when it comes to, to like the kind of drinking or sort of then acting out kind of violence and that kind of thing. And uh, so often men's depression just ends up being treated by the, the police and the, the judicial services rather than, than the health services, which is a great shame. And uh, so it ends up like nobody ever recognises that, that this guy has got criminal convictions or uh, um, or has really poor relationships with people because of of depression or some sort of unresolved trauma or other. I mean, it's, you know, they, they don't get seen as being um, mental health issues. They get seen as, as being the, the behaviours and somebody who's a bit of an idiot and a hard person to deal with. And a, you know, and that I think it's understandable that. that People don't really quite see it. It's, it's more difficult to empathise with somebody who's who's not asking for help and who might even be rejecting help if you offer it to them. But I think it's a challenge for everybody, and especially psychologists, to be able to 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 sort of take a step back and say, okay, this person might be uh, not very communicative and and not uh, and and even be rejecting of my offers of help. But I've got to sort of just allow them to sort of communicate in whatever way that they are experiencing their feelings right now because often men are encouraged like men talk about your feelings actually if a man's feeling really quite 
uh, wound up and aggressive, you might, if he starts telling you all that, you might kind of say, oh, oh hang on a second, I don't want to hear about those feelings, I want to hear about your nice sad feelings that I can sort of, I can deal with now, I, I can't deal with all, um, aggression or talking about you don't like your girlfriend because she doesn't do X, Y, Z properly or whatever in your life, don't want to hear that stuff, you know. So we have a complicated situation when it comes um, to, to men's mental health. Do you have any tips for, say, someone, their colleague is exhibiting these signs and they, they've tried to help and those, the situation you just explained has happened, what, what would the next steps be? Yeah, I, I, it, well, as in the case of somebody who's rejecting help, it can be really difficult, so it, that's a, that, that can be a problem. But I think um, without, uh, it's, and a lot of men don't want to talk about uh, how they're, they're feeling. They, and I, I, it often they get blamed for being stoical and kind of, you know, it's almost as if it's it's their own fault that they want, don't want to talk about things. But I think, again, it's a bit of a gender difference. So like a, a kind of male kind of role for like, kind of, you know, if you, if you look at evolutionary psychology, the male typical thing is to be the, the sort of the protector. Uh, and to, like the protectors don't, you know, you're often in dangerous kind of emergency situations where you can't really stop and, and think about your feelings because if you thought about your feelings, you might think, well, actually, I better not be putting myself in this dangerous situation. I should be doing something different. So men's tendency to talk about the feelings is 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 lesser, probably for these sorts of evolutionary reasons. So trying to get somebody to talk about the feelings is probably not the best thing to do. Um, some psychologists suggest that uh, taking a more indirect approach can work a lot better. Um, and in fact, indirect to the degree that you might kind of, like the, the usual kind of talking therapies that, that we tend to, to, to think are of as the way to deal with mental health, might not be the first port of call for a lot of men. So it's sometimes like kind of, you know, going for a walk and having a, a bit of a chat about maybe the weather or whatever, something, just something, but not necessarily what you think they might be worried or upset about. And not kind of probing too hard, letting letting them kind of, in his own time, kind of decide how much he's going to say and and, and what he's going to say. Uh, um, and these these are things that are kind of, you know, they t it's, it's a, a, like quite a different approach to dealing with mental health. And I think uh, psychologists need to catch on to this too. Um, because, you know, we're, we're losing huge numbers of of men, like lots of men are committing kind of suicide rather than talking to a therapist. Um, and uh, lots of men just kind of have kind of ongoing chronic uh, anxiety or depression, they're kind of wreaking havoc in their lives and other people who are connected to, to their lives too, because we don't have a, an effective way of dealing with men's mental health. And all it is, is a slightly different approach, a more, I would say, more indirect approach. So you might, your aim might be to, to get the guy to be talking about his feelings because everybody benefits from that. But if you just if you kind of say, hey, you know, you, you're seeming like there's something wrong. Tell me about your feelings. You know, you might just kind of get the shutters come down. But if you take a more indirect approach, maybe kind of you know going to the pub. I mean, there, there is some research evidence that having a social drink, like having a, a you know a couple of pints with your friends, help. I like the. the a couple of pints helps you kind of feel a bit more relaxed and you talk about your feelings a bit more and you're kind of a, a relaxed sort of place, a, a, a relaxed environment. That can be good for, you, for men's emotional health and there's a couple of good studies on this. There's not enough research on this or any, or, or lots of other aspects of men's mental health because we don't, it doesn't tend to be in our, on our radar. And I mean, th there's probably loads of, of brilliant uh, advice uh, that will be discovered over the next few years by people who start doing research into mental health in a, in a kind of a, a, a sane and rational way. One of the problems we have at the moment is, is um, a lot of the time when people do think about men's mental health, they start thinking about um, it being the, the result of patriarchy or toxic masculinity or something interfering with their well-being. And these are, uh, I would say, just, uh, you know, deeply unhelpful ways of, of viewing men's mental health. That, that this is just like a, a complete diversion. And I, I, you know, I think proper psychologists should be just using 
the, 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 the methods of investigation that, that, we've, that have been tried and tested for years and not bring sort of, frankly, half-baked kind of theories uh, into, into the realm of psychology. It's not going to work. It's not going to be effective. But, um, but one of the, the things is how do you get uh, the guy to, to talk about his feelings, to open up, and that kind of thing. And, and that, can, uh, that can vary quite a bit. And one of the key things here really is uh, who's doing the asking. So if it, it, like sometimes, like, I mean, it, I hate to say it, but sometimes like it, um, you can phone up, say, like the, the, the helpline that, that your employer gives you, like the, you know, the employee sort of uh, assistance sort of thing. And uh, you might not, you might get somebody who is not very sympathetic to you as a man, or, or like, for, like, you know, say, say a, a guy is stressed because uh, he's, uh, his boss is a woman, uh, or and uh, you know he's he's got issues with her, but she's trying to tell him what to do all the time. Okay, so he's got to, to learn to deal with that in some sort of effective way. But he might be talking to to a counselor who, who's going, whoa, what the hell? This guy's a complete idiot. What's wrong with him? You know, and just be very unsympathetic and uh, end up not really being able to to deliver a very effective therapy for that guy. So you have to have somebody who's who's uh, be able to sort of. Uh, suspend judgment, be empathetic, and sort of you know give give the the bloke a break. And there has been some research. Um, again, uh, Martin Seeger, who's um, uh, probably the, the main uh, guy in, in men's mental health in the UK, um, did some research with uh, Samaritans uh, a few years ago, where he trained um, uh, the the helpline people. Um, to, to deal with male callers more effectively. What they found was that, that men would phone up and, and very quickly they'd, they'd ring off. Like they, they, the, the phone calls with men tend to be short and not really kind of go anywhere therapeutically. Um, or not therapeutically, they're supposedly not a therapy sort of thing. But, um, but what he did was uh, uh, he did this program called Man Talk and he just got, um, he didn't give people a load of kind of tips and tricks for helping men with their mental health. What he did was he, he got people to just think about uh, men's uh, uh, mindsets and men's feelings. So, for example, he would get um, like uh, he would have a, like one of his workshops. Um, they had a, a musician come in and start playing the blues, and then then you'd have a discussion about the lyrics and kind of what they meant. And like a lot of these lyrics are about sadness and like like my kind of you know my baby left me and like you know I woke up this morning I felt like shit and things like that. Um, and like really kind of saying, okay, but well the, this this is a man who's like uh, you know he's he's not the master of his destiny in any kind of grand way. Uh, he's feeling pretty bad. He's, feel, he's feeling sad. Maybe we can have some sympathy for him. But but also maybe he's he's also singing about drinking because he's sad and kind of you know kind of you know not really reaching out in any sort of way that we recognise as as being help seeking behaviour. Uh, so, you know, uh, and that that um, that man talk uh, program uh, was very effective in helping people deal with the male callers uh, better. Uh, uh, one of the reasons I, I, that that kind of seemed to, to, to stand out too was getting people to recognise that uh, that um, uh, banter, which uh, it doesn't tend to I mean to go down too well in the workplace these days, uh, because you get lots of people who, who don't understand. The, the banter, like, kind of, it's like, for, for like, it, it looks like it's insulting, and it looks like it's a bit aggressive, and it can be, it can go a bit bad. But for a lot of guys, it, it's kind of like it's male typical communication, and sort of like, you know, getting to know each other a little bit, and sort of maybe kind of, you know, poking each other a little bit, and sort of just testing the boundaries a bit. But it's kind of guys getting to know each other a bit, and it's not, um, it's not taken as being offensive in any sort of. Way a lot of the time, so and it can go wrong, and it can sort of, you know, uh, it, it can sort of be malicious and things like that. But very often it isn't. Um, but I think that that we we often uh, get, um, and it's perhaps again going back to, to the psychology profession, where uh, you know most of the clinical psych psychologists, about eighty percent, are women, uh, and it kind of banter is a more male typical thing. So I think you get a lot of psychologists if you. 
if they if they have a male client and they and he's starting kind of talking about football or maybe trying to make a joke or something like that, uh, the psychologist might think, well, this guy's a joker. Well, what's he what's he doing? Well, like he's not taking this seriously, and just think, well, he's not ready for therapy really. Whereas if you take a more sort of male centric approach, you might appreciate, okay, so this is he's kind of like this is his way of saying hello. He's kind of test seeing if I if I can take a joke if I can take a joke maybe he thinks okay this guy's okay I can uh, you know he, he can take a bit of a joke he can talk about football he, he's sort of not too up his own arse or anything like that you know this this is he can feel a bit more relaxed um, but men I think are less likely to kind of reach out for any kind of therapy or to anybody else if they think that they're not going to get hurt and I think at the moment we have a, a bit of a gulf between uh, the people in the, the therapy industry uh, uh, who are saying, "Here, yeah, come on, man, open up, tell us your feelings," and men kind of kind of saying, "I know that if I tell you what I'm feeling, you're not going to like it. You know, you're not. I'm not going to be heard. Like you, I'll, I'll say one thing, you're going to hear something totally different. It's not. It's not going to be a positive experience for me. So I, I think that we we have to be ready to like if if we do want to." ask a guy about what he's feeling or finding out about it, we've got to be prepared to, to find, like we might find stuff that we don't really want to know about. I mean, and that, that could, it could include things like um, uh, trauma, like trauma of being abused, like my, maybe sexual abuse in childhood and things like that. I mean, these can be sometimes the, the kinds of things that, that, that can cause them some of the worst uh, behavior in men. And uh, you know we have to be prepared to sort of, uh, and I think it's more maybe for professionals to be, to be able to do that. But we have to be prepared to, to to deal with that, like what might seem on the surface to be uh, destructive uh, behavior, negative behavior f to, towards everybody else, might be quite a lot of self-destructive stuff going on for, for for that man, and feeling like he's got no way of communicating that to anybody who's going to be able to, to listen to it. There's a lot of, clearly there's a lot of tension on uh, mental health and men's mental health. Uh, but I would say it's sort of surface level and the things that we've discussed today dig down a lot into it. So how do we get the, the word out about the things that you're talking about and the, the approaches that maybe many people don't think about? Well, uh, it, uh, within psychology as a profession, we, we have, myself and Martin, Martin Seeger have campaigned for a male psychology section of British Psychological Society. Uh, we're uh, trying to kind of raise awareness among psychologists about these sorts of issues. Uh, we find that a lot of clinical psychologists and a lot of therapists in, in general, counselors, psychotherapists, they get it straight away. Uh, even if they haven't thought about it before, like hadn't been consciously aware of these patterns of communication and behavior in their male clients, as soon as you start talking about it, they get it because they've been there. They've had that experience, and and suddenly loads of different clients that they, that they've had, they, they suddenly can say yes, that that explains their behaviour, that, that their whole attitude. Um, so that's that's what we're doing. We're we're trying to help raise awareness among psychologists in the general public. I think one thing that would help a lot is um, people uh, giving men a bit more of a break. I think that there's been a kind of a lot of negative press, like like in the media, there's a lot of talk about toxic masculinity, and a, a lot of the time, to, like talking about smash the patriarchy and stuff like this. And like, I think men are supposed to, to just take it on the chin and just behave as if, well, this this is all okay. I can take it. I'm mad. It's just somebody saying something. Um, you know, I think if we have a, a, an environment that, in a lot of ways, is very um, challenging of men and male behavior. For example, the, the, the term toxic masculinity, some people say, well, this is just a, a kind of describing a particular type of behavior that you most often see in men, and, uh, and it's a particularly bad sort of behavior. When you use terminology like toxic masculinity, it's really, really difficult to, to have that category of just this particular type of behavior, not kind of, uh, you know, expand and sort of leak out and affect all men you know because like you have these programs in school where ki where you know school kids are, are taught about you know they have to be careful not to like you can do this and you can't do that and so and, uh, you know i suppose in some ways i mean this this 
could help some, you know, somebody who really doesn't get kind of social rules and, and kind of boundaries and things like that. I mean, some people, like, you know, they, they don't get it, so they might benefit. But I think the majority of men, or the majority of schoolboys, um, hearing that kind of thing are, are just going to be going, uh, hang on a second, like, you know, am I a potential monster like that? I, I didn't think that I was, but maybe I am. And you'll get some people who will internalize that, feel bad about themselves, and, uh, you know, maybe not develop relationships because they, they to feel so bad about themselves. And so you get some people who react against that and just say, well, that's not me, you're an idiot. You know, I'm, I'm never gonna listen to anything from a, a, a teacher or a counselor or, or, a, or a psychologist again. I think we have to, to really think again about all these messages that we think are for, for the, the common good, uh, but are actually maybe quite toxic to men, I think. A, lo a lot of this stuff, I think, is toxic to men. In society, everyone is expected, once they reach a certain age, that, they, that, they, that they, they have to go to work, they have to provide, they have to you know, um, earn an income and that sort of thing. So what, what, what sort of things do you think, from, like, from the point of view of an organisation, top down perhaps, that, that could, they, they can do to, to support the cause as well? Yeah, that's a really good question. And um, I have just, uh, um, I've done some research uh, the, in, the, in the last couple of years looking at um, the, the, the kinds of things that, that uh, are most uh, enhancing of men's mental well-being. And we found, we did a couple of surveys, one in the UK, one in the States, uh, 7,000 men in total. And we found that by far the, the, the thing that most predicted uh, men's well-being was job satisfaction. And uh, relationship stability was, uh, was kind of bubbling around kind of uh, after that. But um, job satisfaction is really key for men. So um, like if, if a man's uh, work is not going too well, if it's, that's becoming stressful, that's really going to be doing his head in. You know, it's, it's like, you know, so having men feeling good about the, their work is, you know, that has a big effect on men. Uh, like men's stress at work, it, you know, that, that's going to have a big a negative effect on lots of, of their life too. It can destroy all sorts of aspects of man's life. What can employers do about it? Um, I think if they're going to be, uh, like a lot of employers in the last uh, couple of decades have, have cut onto the idea of uh, providing some sort of uh, a program for employees. So if they, if they are feeling stressed or uh, um, you know, depressed or anything like that, having problems, they, they can talk to an independent uh, counsellor or get get one-to-one -one therapy. To, you know, depending on the employer, um, I, and I was, I'd say that's brilliant. But it, they uh, should definitely be uh, aware that that men um, are not always like the, the kinds of things that are on offer are not always going to be the kinds of things that men will gravitate to. And again, I'm like, talking in general generalisations. Like some men will just want to talk about their feelings, like that will work perfectly for some men. But for a lot of men, and and these might be the men that we, we might be most worried about, because like, so a lot of men are not going to want to talk about their feelings. So if you offer them counselling, and they, they think, oh, I've got to turn up and start saying, talking about my feelings about my mum and dad and stuff like that, I mean, that, that might not be what they want to do. But if, if you have other things, um, that that are maybe more solution focused, so that like you're not they're not emotion focused, they're solution focused. Like things like um, coaching, life life coaching. Um, this can be like sort of like just sort of like what's what is the problem that you have? Okay, well let's see about how we can sort of resolve that problem and how you can feel better as as a result of that. And so it's kind of much more sort of practical uh, solution focused type of stuff. Um, also, things like hypnotherapy. I, I practice hypnotherapy myself, and uh, I didn't. I didn't start doing it because I thought it was a male-friendly thing. But actually, I found that um, uh, I've I've always had at least fifty percent of my workload as being men, and, and usually kind of psychotherapy type workloads are, are predominantly women. Uh, and more and more these days, that I get men uh, come to see me, and it's uh, and I, I've only realised in the last few years of being interested in that psychology. That, um, that the appeal of hypnotherapy is that you, you don't have to talk about your feelings. You can sort of just sit back, let somebody do something to your brain, and you feel better. 
and uh, you know, it's kind of bypasses a load of this stuff, which is, um, you know, largely true too. Like it, it does kind of like a, like a, it is very kind of solution focused. It's like, okay, what's the problem? How would you like to feel instead? Okay, that, I got it. So let's do that, and then and then you do hypnotherapy, which is largely the person sitting back and having a, a relaxing time. By and large, that's what it is. So it does appeal quite a bit to men. Uh, so I would um, I would say it's quite important for employers to, to think about what kind of stuff that they have on, on offer and whether it's a male-friendly option. And to, to maybe investigate whether uh, there, there is a... Uh, the American Psychological Society last year came out with some guidelines on working with men and boys, uh, some of which are brilliant, uh, but some of which are terrible. So the, the, uh, so the brilliant guidelines are, are things like a, I've mentioned, uh, uh, actually, some some that I haven't mentioned, like a, like use of language. So, kind of like a therapeutic type language is a bit off-putting for men. So, if you, you talk about seeing a psychotherapist, I mean, it sounds much less appealing than if you you're seeing a coach or if, if you're uh, seeing somebody who's going to um, teach new strategies for living. You know, kind of things like that. If, you, if you're careful about your language, you you can be much more appealing to men. And so some of these guidelines, uh, these, these APA guidelines, were very, very good. Um, and, um, but some of them were terrible. So like the terrible stuff was saying that like lots of the problems that men have are about masculinity, and masculinity is just a social construct. So what we need to, to do as therapists is to, to help men to sort of change their masculinity in some sort of way. And to kind of, uh, you know, get men to realize that a lot of the problems are, are a, because of their part in the patriarchy, and that, that they have to kind of like a lot of men's mental health issues, like are about um, kind of uh, needing to feel the need to dominate women, uh, or feeling the need to to be homophobic and things like that. I mean, and I think for loads of men that they'll, if they realise that their counsellor was was being kind of schooled in these guidelines and taking that sort of approach, I think loads of men would run a mile, and I think they'd be right. To, I think those sorts of of um, approaches that are uh, unscientific. I mean, like I'd love to see the evidence for helping a man by by teaching him that there's something wrong and with his masculinity. And I think a much more positive approach, and a lot of employers uh, should should look for this in therapists, are people who have got a more uh, positive approach to masculinity and kind of see that. Okay, so. So it's kind of male typical for a guy to, to want to, to, to work and kind of work hard. Uh, and so, you know, you get a lot of men who maybe work too hard for kind of presenteeism can be an issue and things like that. But I try to kind of recognize that, that this isn't um, somebody who's just trying to dominate the workplace or something like that. It, this is just, this is something that, that men tend to want to do. And, and we can, you know, you can theorize about why they, they're like that, and you know, that there's, some theories are more plausible than others, but, but instead of criticizing that, just saying, okay, well, that, that's kind of what men are like a bit. And I think, because if you try and sort of kind of change these things too much, I mean, you, you're just really up against changing like you know, hundreds of thousands of years of evolution of, of patterns of behavior. It's mm -hmm. extremely difficult. And some of this stuff is also biologically based too, so. You know, you're really you know, trying to change biology uh, with some sort of talking therapy or something like that. I think that, that this is like a good example of not just wasting time, but also, uh, you know, doing a social experiment with with um, with vulnerable men. You know, uh, it's it's not going to help anybody. So uh, uh, employers should be, I think, if if they're They're having doing their, their mental health uh, uh, sort of provision for them, and it's something again with the, within the the British Psychological Society. Uh, we've just only last year started up this section, so we're, we're kind of gathering pace. We're, we're doing things like we we got a book out, uh, this sort of quite hefty looking thing. Um, we got a book out which we're hoping is going to influence a lot of, of uh, clinical psychologists. There's loads of, of information about how. Like uh, you know, best practice given like um, people who have like spent their careers working with men in different sort of fields, um, and we're hoping that 
lots of therapists and uh, psychologists and other therapists will, will take notice of this. Um, we're going to be doing more training with people, so hopefully we, we get not just a sort of one-size-fits-all approach to therapy, or even this, this new sort of negative view of men in therapy, but we have a more sort of positive approach. And, and this broad positive approach, I mean, it's not positive just because we want to be nice about men or something like that. I think it's, it's based on the, um, the basic idea of positive psychology, that you're going to get more out of people by drawing upon their strengths rather than sort of, you know, focusing on what's wrong with them. And I think that's, we, we have a lot, uh, uh, you know, way too much in the last uh, couple of decades of, of, of uh, seeing men as being problematic. And I think it's, that, that's just not, that's not a way of making men mentally healthy. It's really interesting stuff. So let's say someone's listening to this podcast and they resonate with it. They recognize some of their behaviors are typical with uh, what you were explaining earlier, what would be your advice that the first thing that they do is, the first steps to getting help is? Talking to, to friends and family can, can be a good thing. So like, depending on the, the level of the problem, talking to, to friends and family uh, can be good. I mean, just talking in, in general it is a good thing. Men tend to not want to, to do it very much, which is okay, but, but it's just good for them to be aware that, that it is good. Like if you, You've got something that, that's really eating away at you, winding you up. Uh, talking to somebody who you can trust and who's not going to start judging you badly, um, that that can help quite a bit, you know. So so doing those sorts of things. There's other things um, that that you can do that are not really uh, therapies as such. Like um, as I mentioned, you know, you could talk down to your friends about whatever the the, the, the problem is. Um, uh, going uh, like uh, exercise, a lot of people like to, to kind of go to the gym or just go for a walk, like walk the dog, is going to go off and have a walk in the woods or something like that, it can be uh, quite therapeutic. Um, even things like kind of, you know, uh, playing football, you know, things like that, you know, kind of team sports kind of. Um, loads of these things that seem like kind of very everyday ordinary activities uh, can be quite uh, good things to do. Uh, unfortunately, that things like going to a football game I and mean, these these sorts of things have kind of become a bit unfashionable because it's a bit like oh, it's just a blokey, stupid thing to do. Actually, sort of get together with a bunch of blokes and sort of shouting and kind of singing and, and things like that and having a couple of pints. I mean, that that can all be like you know, qu like whatever stress you had before that, you might not be feeling any of it afterwards. So so these things can be quite good too. Um, and in terms of therapy, I'd say. Uh, just uh, I mean, good general advice is, um, if you're looking for a therapist, is is to try and sort of sound them out a bit, like see if you can, uh, uh, like I give a, a free initial consultation of 20 minutes, so that, like somebody can either talk to me on the phone or meet me in person, and they they can decide whether they think that that we we just kind of get along, and you can usually get some sort of sense with somebody whether you go to you, you feel like you can get along with them. Okay, so I I would say to men to um, to do that, like kind of, like just don't kind of, you know, pick a number out of the phone book or something like that. Just have it, whoever it is that you're thinking about talking to, have a chat with them first, make sure you feel that they're okay. You could ask them about, like, do they take a, a kind of a, 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 a an APA Division 51 approach to, to treating men's mental health, uh, and if if so, find somebody else. Uh, you know, and. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd say in general, just make sure that it's somebody you feel comfortable with. Uh, I mean, talking to somebody who's an expert can really help a, a, a great deal. Um, but a big part of that is that they're they're on your side and you can feel that they're on your side. At SDI, our sort of slogan is surprise, delight, and inspire. And something that I like to ask all of our guests is, what inspires you? A good night's sleep would inspire me <laughs> at the moment. Um, what inspires me? I suppose it might sound a bit boring, but if I, I see somebody who's done some research into an interesting topic and they've got some interesting finding, uh, and especially if it's a surprising sort of thing, um, I really like that. I just think that that's brilliant. Um, it's, that's probably a really boring answer. Yeah, I'm, uh, yeah, I'm kind of boring. As a researcher myself, I completely get that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> You can answer the question too, James. Same question to me. So, um, again, probably a bit of a boring answer, but just 
people people that people that surprise you, people that go out of their way to um, help others. You know, like I, I'll give you an example. There's a guy. Uh, there's a guy I know called um, called Rob, who has just uh, done a 200 mile cycle um, from I think it's from London to Bruges or something like that, and uh, you know, raise a lot of money for for children's hospital in Essex. And you know, to be to be fair, I, I actually wouldn't have expected that of him. Uh, if you're listening, Rob, no offence, but uh, <laughs> for, 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 for him to have, to, for him to have, like have that the gumption to actually get up and do it in the first place, I do I do find that kind of thing that kind of thing inspiration, you know, mm. because it is going out of your way to to help others is is pulls on that pulls on the right heartstring. So sort of following on from that, uh, John, you said that someone that's done some research and it comes back surprising inspires you. What's the most surprising or interesting thing that you found in your research? Yeah, surprising stuff. Um, one of the surprising things was when we started interviewing therapists to find out uh, whether they had, whether they thought that there were any differences in the needs of men and women in therapy. Um, and uh, so we were kind of expecting that they would uh, list some uh, differences. The surprising thing was that they they would they would identify differences between men and women in terms of needs and therapy or preferences for different approaches. Um, but a lot of them, ten, about two thirds of them, uh, would say things like, "I hate to generalise, but," or like, "I know th this this sounds awful, but." So they they would say that identify, I think, legitimately uh, differences in their experience of, of their male and female clients, but they, they were very reluctant to talk about it. And when it kind of, this was a sort of an interview-based study, so we were, myself and, uh, and Sam Russ, who was, work, who was with the Samaritans at the time, we were going through these, these things. And, and th this kind of thing, this pattern of, of, uh, of apologizing for seeing the sex difference, um, just kind of came up over and over and over. It was really, we were just kind of like, here it is again. This is like, you know, this is crazy. We, we hadn't really expected that. And we we, um, we, we d decided this was an example of, of cognitive dissonance. I mean, these were people who had been taught in academia th about this idea of the, the gender similarities hypothesis, that, that men and women are, are, are pretty much identical. So I'm like, like, there's no need to think about any sex differences at all. So if you get told that often enough, you end up sort of training yourself to sort of not think about uh, sex differences. But if you do, if somebody does ask you about, well, have you noticed any differences, that might kind of generate a bit of internal angst about, about like, uh, kind of owning up to having seen these things, -ish, if that's the right way of putting it. But we thought it was like a sign of cognitive dissonance anyway, that like they, they were able to, when prompted, identify these sex differences but they didn't feel comfortable with, with, uh, with doing that. So that was one surprising thing. But yeah, there's been a couple of other times in, um, in uh, research I've done that have been, one of the other things, that, and this is about my polycystic ovary syndrome research. Polycystic ovary syndrome affects about 10% of women. And is one of the characteristics is uh, elevated testosterone levels. Not, not very high, but just a, a bit elevated above the norm. And, um, when I first started out this research, I presumed that the elevated testosterone would cause uh, these women to be more aggressive or more um, uh, angry. Um, but we didn't find that. I mean, it was really perplexing, this, this first study that I did. We found kind of s some things that we thought we'd find, but we didn't find any effect on aggression. And it's just, I had to kind of go back to the, to the literature, and I found that, that Really, this idea that testosterone causes aggression in people, at least anyway, is just a bit of a, a kind of a, a cultural sort of myth that we have. It's actually very reliably related to aggression in rodents. It's like you give a, a rat an injection of testosterone, it will become, uh, it will be, its libido will increase and its aggression level will increase. Um, but uh, in people, it doesn't seem to work the same way. So you get people, uh, um, I think it, like with the steroids, like you get, get this idea of roid rage, as some people call it, like people who kind of take a lot of steroids, get big muscles and everything, and, uh, and then have these explosive outbursts. 
Uh, I'm suspecting that, like, if you, if you, if I had kind of massive muscles, I'd probably think, well, I can throw my weight around a bit more, uh, you know, rather than, you know, uh, uh, than sort of just be more accommodating of people. So I think there's probably that that sort of thing that goes on. Um, but we found uh, in, in the other literature too, there's, there's some actually kind of pro-social aspects to testosterone, which I, I just I wasn't aware of. I was just kind of I had my kind of blinkers on of thinking testosterone is about aggression, but we found that that's not really the case at all. Or at least it's it's a gross oversimplification. So that was another interesting thing. And again, it, like it's in a way, one way kind of wrecked my study because I didn't find what I thought I was going to find, find, but it made it uh, like I learned something from it and it also it forced me to kind of um, to look at, at uh, the PCOS thing from a, a different perspective too, and I, I think a more useful perspective. Oh, that is really interesting. Jane, do you have any closing questions? Um, no. <laughs> no, I don't. You've had a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, it's, been, it's been really, um, really interesting listening to uh, your experiences um, and sort of suggestions on, on, how, on how we can raise awareness and, and identify um, adverse well-being. I think you know, it's, really, it's, it's, it's been a really positive discussion, so I really appreciate it. Thank you, thank you for inviting me on to yeah. thank you for Thank you both for being here. Um, is there anything you want to sort of plug before we, before we wrap up? We've got a, a free event at UCL. We've got a talk by uh, Dr. Rob uh, Whiteley. He's uh, from McGill University in Canada. He's going to be speaking here at UCL about pickup artists. So all you guys out there who are sad because you can't get a girl, well, actually, <laughs> you, you won't learn anything about pickup artists. This is Rob's study of the pickup artist community, um, which I'm guessing it's going to be really, really interesting. I mean, uh, yeah. So that that's my play. Oh, and apart from that, my uh, the book, not my book. It's like I was the editor and I wrote a couple of chapters, or co-authored a couple of chapters, I should say, the uh, Palgrave <coughs> Handbook of Male Psychology and Mental Health. So, uh, so this is by Palgrave Macmillan. Just came out um, a few months ago. Um, it's actually the, the downloads have, have really surprised everybody. It's it's one of their uh, Palgrave's top downloads in psychology, so like a, like for a for a new book. So the, there's, you know, sometimes when you're you're doing research or whatever, you, you don't quite know how well it will be received, how much interest there will be. But we found that there's actually just loads of people who are really interested, and it's a, it's an expensive book, I have to say. So, um, so like I'm quite impressed that that so many people are buying it. Um, I would suggest that, that if anybody does want to get this book and, and doesn't have £140 or whatever it is, um, to if, if you're attached to a university library, uh, see if you can get it from them. If they don't stock it, just ask them to stock it and, and most universities will just get it in stock and then you can get it for free. Fantastic. Thank you so much uh, for sharing really interesting news today, John. Thank you, James, for being here as well.